Welcome to your College Bound Kid, a podcast for parents, college counselors, students, and anyone who wants a weekly deep dive into the world of college admissions. My name is Julia. I was an admission officer at Haverford College, an outside reader for Emory University, and I currently work at Milton Academy, an independent boarding and day school outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Lisa, and I'm a clinical psychologist and college counselor. I have a daughter in college, a daughter in high school, and a son in middle school. After 30 years in Chicago, we recently moved to North Carolina. My name is Mark. I'm a college coach in Atlanta and the parent of two daughters, Karis, a graduate of Davidson College, and she is the founder of the Spanish tutoring company, SpanishHealthToday.com. And Joy is a graduate of the University of Georgia, and she is getting her master's degree at North Carolina State University. This week in the news, Julie and I continue with part two. The exit New York Times article, study of elite college admissions data suggests being very rich is its own qualification in part two of two. Question that was supposed to run last week, but I promise you it'll run this week from a listener. An anonymous listener wants to know, is it better to go for the higher GPA or take the courses you want to take? And the interview is with Evan Mandry. Evan Mandry is the author of eight books, including four novels, as well as the co-creator and executive producer of the TV series Artificial, for which he won a Peabody and Emmy Awards in 2019. He's also author of the book Poison Ivy, about the Ivy League and Ivy Peer Institutions, and that is the book Lisa and Evan will discuss. And we close out with Lisa and Linda having part two of the spotlight that Lisa does on SCAD, also known as Savannah College of Art and Design. Friends, last week, Julie and I talked about the New York Times article on that looks at how being very rich is its own admissions qualification. And we thought it was such an important topic that we're running it over two weeks. You'll now hear the final part of that two-part discussion. So do you think We've covered all the main reasons why the, you know, the affluent have their advantages. So let's recount. So legacy yep. is one, right? Mm -hmm. Development, yep. you know, development advancement, the ability to give a big gift. Af athletics, uh, the cost of athletics from, you know, starting at a really young age. And, and a lot of the students are doing niche sports too. Yes. Niche yep. sports where not that much of the population actually does them. Right. You know, a small percentage of the population, you're not really competing. You've already eliminated most of the competition in the country if you're doing a niche sport that most people don't do. Exactly. You know, and then being at a private school where you there's a certain kind of recommendation letter that happens because like it's Julia's job to work with 40 people and yeah. get to know them really well. Which is and a big caseload, actually. Most we're talking to most kids who go to private schools, they have like twenty five other students they're sharing a counselor with, maybe. And it depends, I will say, you know, like yeah. that's maybe true more in the affluent Boston community. I mean, it, yeah. there's a range of private schools. We have to say that out there. And I know they made the they made the point of not including religious schools, but there's also a range of wealth of schools. I don't want to paint all private schools with the same stroke of the brush. True, but but this we're mostly talking about highly selective competitive schools where, where affluent families send their kids. Yep. So yep. that caliber school. So there's the rec letter. There's something I said that was not in here, but we've both seen it from our own experience a lot, which is the connections yeah. that families of means have and yep. how they pull on those connections. And, and a lot of times those things work. Oh, yep. About 10% of the students I deal with, we actually say it's above our pay grade. It's above the admissions office pay grade and above my pay grade. It is all done with development and with the connections. Like, it is almost outside of the process. Julia, I know earlier I was talking about uh, the one thing this great article doesn't discuss is high net worth individuals using some of their connections. Mm -hmm. To be like the neck to move the head and calling the right person and how sometimes that's what gets them in, especially that 0.1%, which is 3 million and above. Yep. Um, I feel like, uh, I think you probably work with more high net worth people than me. So I, I figure you've probably got a story or two to share 
to make it tangible for people or listeners so they know what we're talking about. Anything come to mind? So my uh, school that I work at is an independent school in the Boston area, an expensive place to live. Also outside of many of these uh, Ivy Plus <laughs> institutions that we've been talking about. So we do have many students that might fit into this 0.1%. Um, and I, w- I would say I have uh, conversations, like I said, that are sort of above my pay grade, as well as our admission officer's pay grade often, where um, I might have a student that has multiple connections to a college, either their parent is a lawyer and their client was a trustee at a local, uh, very selective college, or um, their parents are in the arts world and so is the student and they're able to have sort of introductions to people who might be really influential to the college, either because they're a donor or a famous alum. Um, So I would say very often in my line of work, I do see that connections are sort of that extra thing or many extra things cumulatively that just sort of tip the student in. Um, Oftentimes, I'll actually see this in the regular round, believe it or not, um, because sometimes if the student doesn't have a legacy connection, but other connections to the college, They'd rather do that in the regular round where the impact feels less obvious. Um, It's a bigger school group, so it's harder for people to make sense of why did that student get in compared to the other students. But um, it does happen. Even, I'll say this, even just being really friendly with some very important deans, directors, and VPs as well. Mm-hmm. Um, will definitely be a part of that. Um, so sometimes the parents are friendly with a really major person in admissions or a trustee. Um, and so, and the student is honestly a really admissible student anyway. Sure. So sure. Um, it really just takes that extra, it's sort of their hook. Um, so they go on what's called a development list. Um, that might be a different term at different colleges, but it might not, it, it, it's usually also because that student's family will likely contribute financially as well, even if they are not themselves alums of the college. Um, so sort of keeping things copacetic with your uh, connections socially and professionally, and then taking the student to kind of honor those as well. But I will say one thing I, I do run into that makes it feel a little less gross um, is that oftentimes, you know, if there is a connection like that, the the person offering that kind of connection support will say like, I'm not going to do this if your kid's not going to come. Right. Mm-hmm. So a lot of the time the, the student has identified, I'll absolutely go if you're willing to, mm-hmm. you know, sort of throw your support behind me. Um, and that could be as simple as the student makes the list or, there's about a million people in the ear of the dean of admission saying, admit this person, admit this person, admit this person. When you have about 10 plus voices like that or very heavy voices like that, it, it's very helpful for my students. Yeah. And if you're listening carefully, Julia kind of talked about two different things, but they both can come together, especially with that 0.1%, 3 million uh, or higher in income. Or sometimes it's really not income. It's just tremendous amount of, of family wealth and assets. Right. Uh, so the two things you talked about were development admits as well as connections. Mm-hmm. Sometimes those are the same. Sometimes those are different. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's somebody, a VIP, who's making a call. Um, I'll share a story that I, I didn't haven't shared on the podcast before. Uh, but I once worked with... Um, a family and they were very concerned of their student not being able to get into certain highly selective and elite schools. And they're very good friends with the Koch brothers. Mm. And if you look up, if you don't know who the Koch brothers are K O C H look up the Forbes list of the wealthiest people in the world and see, see where the Koch brothers show up. And so they literally picked schools where the Koch, brothers had given it eight figure gifts or higher mm-hmm. so they looked at where they'd given at least 10 million and and then asked them to to make a call on their behalf with the thinking being that schools are not going to want to offend the Koch brothers because 
I worked in development, you know, and no matter how big a gift you get, you do like donor research on what someone's potential is. Yeah. So even if you've got a $20 million gift, you're looking and behind closed doors, you're saying, we really think they have capacity to give a hundred. Like, you know, this is how you talk like behind closed doors. So you're still concerned with cultivating it. Friends, when I was in development, also known as advancement, this was very clandestine, top secret. We would pay for a subscription service for consultants that would do donor research for us. And they'd produce these very detailed reports that showed the potential that our various stakeholders had to give philanthropically to support the school. We had research on parents, we had research on alumni, we had research on parents of alumni uh, and friends of the school. Now you don't do this for everybody. We would target maybe the 50 people, sometimes 100 that we felt had the greatest potential to give to meet the school's uh, needs. But we did this so that we knew who we needed to cultivate in order to meet our advancement goals. So they literally were like, okay, let's target schools where the Cokes have given eight figure gifts. And then we'll we'll ask if they can make a call on 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 behalf of our student. And I, I just wanted to share this not to discourage people, but to kind of give an insight into how this world works, mm. especially for some of the most, you know, opulent and affluent in society. Mm-hmm. That most of us would just have no clue. Like if I hadn't done this work, I would never know anything about this from my own experience. Right. Same for you, Julia. Like this is a foreign world to us other than we're brought into it sometimes with some high net worth individuals. Right. Or via families. And so it's like the confluence of all these things together that's producing such disparate outcomes. Right. It's not just one thing or two things. It's, it's you know, and I love this article, but I thought, I thought this was one area it didn't mention. And there's another area that I didn't feel it mentioned at all. And we can actually transition to that as well. So one of the things I said earlier that I would come back to is why is it that MIT, the one school in this IB plus group, does not show disparate results for, you know, the 0.1%, the 1% compared to that group making between 68,000 and 613, which was the group that really statistically appeared to be losing out. And there's three things MIT does very differently than most of these other schools. And I would briefly touch on them. You know, so the first thing is legacy. We've talked a lot about legacy, so I don't really want to hang my hat here too much. I feel like we've talked about it and we're going to continue to keep coming back to it because it's under assault. And every week the new school drops, you know, UVA now is doing a restricted version of legacy. And so Virginia Tech, I mean... So it just continues. I mean, it's hard to just keep track with how quickly schools are changing because of pressure, um, at least in public pronouncements. But, you know, it wasn't super long ago. I think it was in the last decade. Uh, But MIT got rid of legacy. So that's a big thing, right? The second thing, and I don't think we've ever talked about this on this podcast because I have a memory. For some ways, some ways my memory's terrible, Julia. I can forget (laughs) names, but some ways it's not bad. And this one I would remember. We talked about athletic recruiting. Um, it went live on last week's episode, but uh, we didn't really talk about it. MIT does athletic recruiting different than other schools in Ivy and NESCAC. Mm-hmm. And why don't you talk to share with our listeners how MIT does athletic recruiting differently? And this this is a, one of the big reasons because we already identified athletics as one of the biggest reasons for this disparity. But go ahead and share. So for my students, uh, especially for the Ivy Leagues and ESCAC, so we talked about, you know, uh, coaches would like to see a, a solid student, but they're a lot more uh, uh, kinder in the the sort of breadth of the type of student they're willing to take. So a coach might ask one of my students from a NESCAC or an Ivy, like, um, you know, what's your score? And if the score is not great, the, the coach is like, that's fine. Let's just not use it in recruitment. You're still admissible. 
Um, and then MIT will come knocking. And so my students come up to me and they're like, but it's okay, right? It's okay. I don't have, you know, a high SAT or ACT score. It's okay. I didn't take, you know, you know, the highest uh, sciences. I'm like, oh no, oh no, you need to have, you need to be on, on par with who to admit regardless of your athletic talent. Um, your athletic talent got your foot in the door, but it does not uh, make you admissible. Um, so, so my students who I just I just recently talked to a student, um, and they were like, and I was like, guess what? We have a better chance at Tufts right now, <laughs> um, or or Amherst, um, just because the coach even said to the student like. I'm expecting, and this is a majority student with wealth, right? This is not someone who's coming from a background where obtaining a high test score, really high grades is out of the question. Um, the student needed to still have, for, for the coach to really support them in the admissions process, the student needed at least a 1500 SAT um, and a 35 ACT, um, and then needed to have redone their entire senior year curriculum, including like skip a level in math. So basically it's the same thing you might get a little more kindness to you if you've got an athletic hook but it's really very different than the NESCACs and the IV recruitment in terms of what they're looking for academically so Julia shared a great stat last week and um, I'm going to ask you to share it again Julia and I don't want to make a point it had to do with um athletes at Harvard that got a four reading in there and you can explain what a four is again in case people miss that and just explain what a four is, and you can see that the, the the extent to which the thumb on the scale carries weight in Harvard's process. Sure. So Harvard uses a, um, and this is out there. This is not like you know secret information. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Julia um, blowing the whistle on yeah, Harvard. Like <laughs> <laughs> Big New York Times story coming, Julia. Exactly. <laughs> Sometimes people think I have quote. Uh, I don't. I had a family who told me I had trade secrets that I wasn't <laughs> sharing with them, and I was like, oh no. It's amazing um, the stuff you hear when you yeah. do do this work. And I have to tell two things quickly in the last. In the last three weeks, I had one parent say to me, I feel like you're my pastor. I started <laughs> laughing. And and then another one said, um, it was a referral from somebody, right? And I said, well, what, what did they say when they referred me? They said you saved their marriage. <laughs> oh, wow. No, I've never gotten any of those kind of accolades. <laughs> Trade secrets is up there. <laughs> I, it was. It meant in a negative way. I was withholding. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, go ahead and break this down. You're giving the numbers again. Mm -hmm. Um. So, so Harvard, when they're doing their ratings of applicants, just to sort of standardize the process when they're in committee, so they're able to say, "Oh, this applicant read on this scale on this number." Um. So their scale is one through six, with one actually being the highest. Six is the lowest. Um. And and. This is from, I believe the data is from 2018, so or 2016, rather, excuse me. So it's a, it's a little outdated, but um, I would say that it's on par with what I experience. Um, for recruited athletes, so these are students who were supported by coaches and applied to Harvard, um, if they had a rating of four, so that's pretty low, right, out of six, um, they had an acceptance rate of 70.46% which is nearly 1000 times greater than the students who got who were not athletic recruits who got a rating of 4 for their academics those students were admitted at 0 0.0676% 0 0.076%. So nearly 1000 times more likely to get in with an ac a lower academic rating if you're a recruited athlete. You know, you remember when I spent a week at Harvard in 2019 for their training program that they have, yeah. Harvard SICA? Yes. And I was having a conversation with Fitzsimmons, who's over that office, been so for over 50 years. And just so you know, I really, really like him a lot. So just so I'm going to put that background. He's so personable. I just like him a lot. But he was talking to me about another one of your competitors. Mm -hmm. What's the day school that's really academic, but it has lots of athletes and they send a lot of kids to harvard nobles yes <laughs> and he was telling me they got 12 kids this year yes. you know this year from nobles 
And then he started listing how many of them were athletes. He was like, we got a squash player, we got this, we got that. Like, and I remember just mentally filing that away. That doesn't surprise you at all. You're nodding over here. <laughs> I remember, like, honestly, like eight of the 12 were athletes. He was going through that. So I didn't have that data at the time. But anyway, so the thing about MIT is that, you know, the way I would explain my understanding from, from, of, of how they do athletic recruiting from working with them is they will do a recruiting from the standpoint of they'll have coaches that reach out to you just like anybody else does mm -hmm. to like exactly. to build that relationship and to yep. show the warmth. And I've had that with many of my students, but it's almost like, okay, we'll show you the warmth, but you almost have to like earn your way in. Like we're not really lowering our academic standards. No, nope, we'll, like, we'll let all. you know how much we want you and how we'll provide supports and how we'll make this a great experience. But to me, it's closer to, and I know, Julie, you know, you, you, you deal with this, I'm sure, every year, you know, as, as do I, where you'll have some coaches that will say to people, we have a spot for you on the team, but you're not really going to go through the pre-read process. You kind of need to get through admissions. Right. If you can get through admissions, then there'll be a spot for you. It's preferred walk-on, right? Preferred walk-on, we call mm -hmm. it. Like, to me, the MIT method is closer to preferred walk-on than it is to extra thumb on the scale. Like it's all the love, it's the relationship building. We'll show you what MIT has to offer, but don't expect lowering of admission standards. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And it can't just be like, oh, let me go for some major that's underrepresented there and sure. then maybe I can fly under the radar. Oh no, they expect yeah. you to be prepared for their calculus classes. <laughs> Yeah, I know some of it, of course, is the way they're set up. Like everybody has to take certain levels of, you know, their core. Like some everybody's going to be taking some, some, you know, some math and science classes there, no matter what your major is. Right. So there's no room to hide someone who might not have strength in some areas. But anyway, so, so just to recap, so MIT's, MIT's not doing legacy. MIT's doing athletic recruitment different from everybody else. And then. I love this article, but there was another major thing I didn't think the article talked about. And I think let's talk about it. MIT does not have early decision. Right. Not, not only that, MIT does not have restricted early action. Mm -hmm. Single choice. They don't have single choice early action or even the version that you see from Georgetown and Notre Dame where you can apply EA as long as you don't apply anywhere else ED. Like you can actually apply to MIT early action and apply ED somewhere else. Yeah. You can apply to MIT early action and you can apply to any other early action schools you want. The only thing that they say on their website is if you apply to us and you also apply to a restrictive early action school like a Stanford or a Penn, you know, Princeton, you know, Yale, Harvard, we, from an integrity standpoint, we expect you to honor their condition of not applying early action anywhere else. So they do say that, but that's that's because they are the one who's imposing the restriction. Right. We think you should be completely free to apply to any early school you want to and have all the way up until May 1st to decide. Now, I know early decision is a common use strategy and it's not just a strategy only for the 0.1%. But let's really take a look at it. And I'm about to interview Ron Lieber uh, eight days from today. He's been very outspoken on this in, in his book, The Price You Pay for College, right? He's like, it's a lot to expect somebody to commit to a school that's going to cost them potentially $400,000 after taxes, which is really what the most expensive schools are going to be when you when you add 3 to 5% price increases if you're sitting there with a, a junior student or a sophomore student it's going to be 400 grand after taxes to expect somebody to commit to paying that without having any idea like one what else another school might offer me or for schools that do offer merit like am i going to get merit from you or not like that's a lot to ask the overwhelming majority of the population mm-hmm you know, you're, you're probably have to be in the top three to four percent of the income scale for that to just not be a factor for you at all. Or maybe you've been saving from the time you've really been young and you've built up a really nice 529 
or maybe you have, you know, grandparent help or something like that. But for the overwhelming majority of people, that is just not something they're comfortable with. And then you couple that with the counseling piece. Like if you're in a public school, you don't even know how all this stuff works. You might even not even know what early decision is or right. anything like that. Right. And how it actually even works. So I do want to shout MIT out. I, you know, I'll be critical about them. Like in my interview with, with PD, I was critical of the fact that I don't think they need to have their own application. I think they need to be more sensitive to the mental health needs of students. And couldn't you come use the Common App and have some customized questions rather than ask people to do an entire application? So, I'll, you know, this is not like a puff piece on MIT. I'll criticize them if I think, you know, don't agree with something. But, um, and I've even questioned whether... How much data do they have to really say without a test score, someone can't be successful here? Other schools, like why is Caltech able to to not only admit kids without test scores, but say we can do it and do it in a way where we have similar graduation rates, similar retention rates, similar GPAs between, you know, test submitters and non-submitters, like go back and learn how to read a file better. Like I'll criticize them on some things if I feel that warrants it, but in this area, like to me, when you look at those three things, legacy, athletics, early decision, they do it so differently. And we know those are three of the biggest culprits of this differential admit rate between the 1% and the 0.1% of the population at large. Yep. I think it's explained right there. And I and I give them a lot of credit because all three of those things are things that there's tremendous pressure, mm. tremendous pressure. You know, I was having a conversation with a friend of mine who is former Yale admission officer. And I drove 5000 miles on this trip, Julia, so I had a lot of time <laughs> to talk and I appreciate it. People that would call me, I had a two hour, com two hour conversation with her. You know, we were just talking about college admissions. She, she does college counseling now. And and we were just having a conversation about legacy and why schools don't want to give it up. And she said, she just really put it simply. She said, it just comes down to two things, donors and yield. Yep. Those two things, donors and yield. You know, legacy are going to give more money, generally speaking, not everybody, but some. And they're, I mean, if you're in my conversation with Matt Bonser, we we're talking about demonstrated interest. Like legacy is a better predictor. Oftentimes it's a demonstrated interest factor often and can be correlated with yield. So, um, so they're giving that up and then, you know, their coaches are not happy. Like I wouldn't want to be a coach there who you have to go against and not, not, you know, right. the way that they have to recruit compared to who they overlap with. Mm -hmm. And, and then this third thing, I mean, in admissions, Boy, getting knowing knowing who's going to commit and not commit really, really can help you bring your class in a, a lot. Right. Tremendously. And I know when I was in admissions, it was a big deal to me. If I knew this person is committing and this person is not committing, that other person had to be significantly stronger. Exactly. Just passing over the one who wanted to play the field versus the sure bet. I was going to go for the sure bet the majority of the time. Most of the, you know, you always have your high flyers and you're like, OK, I got to go for you because you're just so strong. Right. But they have to be, you know, precipitously higher and stronger yeah. as an applicant. So anyway, I've been rambling here, Julia. I know you're I know you have something you want to add. What are your thoughts? No, I just uh, this is sort of uh, what I traffic in <laughs> most of the time. So I think it's you know, it, it it is helpful. Sometimes I think, you know, sometimes students choose my school it's because they think we have this great matric list. And actually, if I were to break down each of those matriculants at these IB plus schools, I, you would be hard pressed to not find one of these pieces as to why they're admitted. And I'll even say this, even those high flyers you just talked about, some a lot of the time, even from my school, I mean, like the best kid we have in the grade won't get into these very IB plus places. Um, in the regular round because so many of that population has already applied and been admitted or not so many, but an overrepresentation, I should say, of what the actual population is. And so we tell my students who are very, very privileged, you know, you got to pick your early school and that's where you got to put your weight behind because 
um, these IB plus places are really trying to find more people that aren't coming from the 1% um, or the 0.01% mm-hmm. in the regular round. Because just like you said, Mark, these are people that maybe didn't get a chance to apply early. Um, they're part of a, a, a population that's underrepresented. Um, so if anything, I will say that there's some balance restored <laughs> in the regular process, but that is why almost a hundred percent of my students, even my low income students will apply, uh, to, uh, early decision, restrictive early action or early action to at least one place. Yeah. And, you know, and I, and I, I don't want to go off on a tangent here, but, um, being, being a high financial need kid oftentimes ed can be your a great strategy for you yeah absolutely because, because, wesleyan is a great example of that they ask for that yeah well well a lot of times you can get into a school that has money that you might not have got into mm-hmm. in the regular round because they have money but they're also more competitive right or you can get the unbelievable packages that come out of the princetons and the yales and the stanfords and the harvards but the thing about that is that takes really good counseling yeah. because when you talk with that population, like I remember when I first got to KIPP, they were completely anti-ED. I had to like teach them the, you know, and they saw all the kids that I was working with, they're getting an ED and I had to teach them. This isn't scary if you apply to the right school, but it's still a counseling issue that absolutely. most people don't know. It's absolutely like jumping off a bridge to a high need kid to commit to apply without without that but you know you brought up another thing i think it's really important i want to comment on one group i sometimes feel sorry for is parents sometimes who pick independent schools because they see what looks like a really impressive college list exactly and they're like wow look at where all those kids are going to college ipso facto that means i'm going to get that's what my kid is going to have as an outcome. Right. And what they really don't realize is if you were actually to break down all these kids with all these great opportunities, one, you'd see a lot of athletes that, by the way, the independent school partly recruited them Absolutely. knowing they were athletes. Yeah. That's what helped them get in in the first place. Exactly. And so you're not competing with that kid who's been honing their athletic skills since they were four. Right. Right. And development, if you don't have that ability to give that big gift, there's nothing that you can do. And if you don't have the connections that they have, then there, there's nothing that, that you can do there. And if you're really sometimes in that middle group, you may not be able to, to be, you may not be comfortable with early decision. Right. Because or at least certainly not early decision at uh, so many different schools, because the need-based analysis is going to come back and say, you're going to pay 70, you're going to pay 80, you're going to pay 90. And you're like, I can't afford to pay that. Right. I need to go the mirror angle route. So now you're not comfortable with that. So all of the strategies that the schools and the students are using to get into these places to build this really impressive college list, they don't apply to you. Right. And then on top of it, don't let yourself not be in a very good place within the class. You know, let's say you're like in the middle of the class or the bottom half of the class, and you can be really, really strong in some schools and then you put yourself in a pool. I'm going to use your school, for example, Julian. You know, you and I co-counseled together with five kids. Mm-hmm. And they've all gone on and done great things and gotten great colleges. They're all pat- they're not graduates anymore. But I also have another kid who was number one in her class in Florida who's the kind of kid who might even be able to get into an Ivy Plus type school who was denied by your school. So, like, your school's so selective – Yes. You know, <laughs> that you're not taking superstars on the front end. So then if you come in and you're just kind of not average in your public school, but like average in a super competitive school like yours. Right. You know how these schools are. They have egos and they still want you to be toward the top of the class, even if you're in the pool. I mean, Julie and I have talked about schools offline who, you know, we won't say it on here, but dinged a kid with a B plus who had been homeless. Remember that conversation we had? Oh, yes. 
you guys blew a gasket over there. Like, the kid had been homeless for a while. You're going to mm-hmm. ding him over a B plus at, you know? I know. So, so it's just important to know that because that's where I see a lot of disillusionment. Yes. As people pick the school thinking, look at this college list. That will be my option. And they don't realize that all the majority, and that, we know we never t- even talked about faculty connections. Exactly. Faculty, we have a, a lot faculty. of those as well. Yeah, I'm sure you do. You're in yes, Boston. Yeah. You have to have people that work at those schools. You're in the mm-hmm. Boston. Look at all the colleges you have there. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. there's just a lot of reasons why the 0.1% and the 1%. It really being rich really is an admissions advantage. And I thought this article brought out a lot of really good ones. And we've hopefully added for you the connections piece, you know, the early and the early decision piece. So if you're listening to this and you're like, that's great, but I'm not in the 1% and I'm not definitely not in the 0.1%. And you've basically told me that incomes, at, you know, between 68 and 613,000 did not fare well compared to like what, what's, what's the advice other than just be frustrated? Because I had a lot of emails that came in with either anger or discouragement or frustration after this article. I think an important takeaway is to real, while it's super frustrating, it is, it is a function of our society. Essentially it is our, it is the history of the United States. uh, It is the economy of the United States. So in some ways, while it can feel really defeating, I know for some of my students, it also empowers them to realize like, this is not about me. This is not personal. I wasn't not, not smart enough. I wasn't not, not prepared enough. I, you know, it, these things were sort of determined before I even got to the table of applying. And what I'm hopeful for is that we've woken up to a lot of these things. We've seen this happen with test optional. We've now seen it happen with uh, affirmative action, Supreme Court. But people are waking up in ways that um, they might need to be held accountable to as well. And so I know for a fact um, I've had conversations with uh small liberal arts colleges that had to go need aware after being uh, not need sensitive. And they actually increased their middle income uh, applicants and uh, yield rates among middle income folks. So when you're thinking about your policies and how they might interact or not interact with who's coming, that this, this is, this is an important pivot moment to really think about. Um, and I would say that just capitalism in general does not favor uh, certain folks for certain reasons. And unfortunately, the college process is a part of that. But you're obviously in the right space right now because you're listening to how do I help? How do I put myself in this system and do really well with it without those resources? How can I show up in ways that make me uh, give me the same amount of attention and whatnot? But at the end of the day, most admission officers are probably on your side. They are they have to hold their noses sometimes when they read these uh, uh, one percenters or donor uh, or development cases, things like that. So there's you know it does not mean that uh, it is set in stone for you because of your income background, but it's just something to be aware of. Um, and can maybe be empowering if you didn't get the decision you wanted and you find out someone else did get that decision. It might have nothing to do with what you could bring to the table. Yeah. And and I would just add several things. You don't need to go to one of these 12 schools to be incredibly successful. No. And and even even when you look at the statistics that they shared here, like that show that people that go to one of these 12 schools have some financial advantages overall compared to the population at large, um, there's still a minority. So, for example, you know, when the article talked about uh, Fortune 500. Okay, so for example, in life, a lot of times you have a choice. You can look at a glass half full or half empty. So you could bemoan the fact that 12% of Fortune 500 CEOs graduated from one of these 13 schools, or you could say, guess what? That means 88% did it. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Almost nine in 10 didn't go there. Not to say that that has to be your goal, but the point is in emphasizing the advantages that the 0.1 and the 1% have 
this should not be deflating um, to anybody else who feels like their ceiling is capped as to what they can accomplish if they don't go to one of these schools. And that, and that thinking is out there. Oh, definitely. That thinking is very prevalent. Like mm-hmm. one of the reasons why it's such a big deal to some people that they go to one of these schools is because they think their life options and their career options sort of go on a different train track. Right. Right. If, if you don't go here and I'm not going to deny a few exclusive places. Evan Mandery talks about, you know, a law firm in his interview that literally just hires from 10 colleges and universities, you know, in the, in the country. But these are very, a very, 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 very small percentage of the jobs out there. Right. And I do not want people to be discouraged and to think that, well, I guess if I don't go to one of those 12, I guess I'm on the B plan. I'm not on the A plan. Because really nothing could be further from the truth. Exactly. But I think this coincides so well because, you know, please listen to Evan's interview because I think one thing that gives him a lot of credibility is he's a graduate of Harvard and a graduate of Harvard Law. And he makes such a compelling case about the myth of the meritocracy of these schools. Right. You know, because there's a perception that these are the brightest and the best. Right. And he challenges that, I think, in some really cogent and compelling ways. So, well, we'll continue to shed light on it like a disinfectant. And and by the way, no shame in your game if you're in the top 1% or 0.1%. There's a lot of people that would like to be there. You know, um, don't feel guilty about that. But at the same time, like Ann Richards said about George Bush, he was born on third, you know, born on third base and thought he hit a triple. Yeah. <laughs> like be, be, you know, be, be conscious of your own privilege. Right. And, and don't necessarily think you're better than because you're, you're better off or more fortunate and you've had more advantages. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Awesome. All right. See you next month, Julia. Thanks, Mark. And now it's time for a question from one of our listeners. All right, Lisa, I get fired up by these listeners like this one here that say they listen every Monday and every Thursday. We love our regular listeners. Um, any thoughts on this? Oh, I think I think Anonymous has posed a really great question that is particularly relevant to uh, the state that I live in. So I'm really curious to hear your answer. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm calling from Kentucky. I love listening to your podcast every Monday and Thursday. Thanks so much for all of your wonderful insights. I have a question regarding academic rigor and GPA. What are your thoughts on demonstrating academic rigor versus taking advantage of a school's curriculum? For example, which student would stand out more to a highly rejective institution, the 5.0 student who took only five APs or the 4.64 student who took five APs plus two other regular classes such as piano and Spanish? Should a student, quote, game, unquote, the system to only take APs resulting in a higher GPA? which also would lead to a better chance at valedictorian. What are your thoughts? Thanks. So this was a little tricky for me. I had to play it three or four times because on one hand, it said a student had a 5.0 with five APs. And then the other student had five APs also, but took piano and Spanish, but they had the 4.64. So they didn't necessarily have less APs. Right. So I wasn't quite clear on the gaming of the system part there because they, they had similar levels of of APs. Or is there something that I'm missing? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. You are missing this. And this is what is really relevant in North Carolina high schools. Um, so class rank is based on GPA and class rank is mandatorily reported in the state of North Carolina. And it's really competitive. So people game the system. So you only want to take classes that are worth 5.0. So taking piano or Spanish is going to kill your class rank. Oh. Right? So, I mean, the five, the kid who is just doing the academics and isn't learning a foreign language or playing the piano or doing all those things we want kids to do is getting going to get higher in the class rank. And the kid who chooses to do that during the school day is getting punished in terms of class rank. So one thing that threw me off for that is Spanish is one of the five core subjects. So why would that not be, you know, considered? I mean, it's a standard, 
you know, across the board that math, English, science, social studies, and foreign language are your five core classes. Well, I think that but sometimes foreign language isn't given a bonus point. Like maybe you could do an honors and get half a bonus point, but that's not good enough if you're playing the GPA game. In North Carolina, a lot of times people will try to test out of any 4.0 class. They have a like a demonstrated mastery testing system because they don't want any 4.0 classes on the on the record at all. They only want 5.0 classes or maybe a 4.5 because that's what you have to do in order to be in the top 10%. And if you want to go to UNC Chapel Hill, you have to be in the top 10%. So it really determines how you plan your schedule here. So that, I would say this is very unique and unusual because most highly rejective colleges are private and this is not how they operate. This is not how, you know, because she used the term well, highly rejected. So I just want to, I don't want to give people the impression that this is some, like you're being, you're going to be rewarded for this type of strategic thinking at most highly rejected colleges. It's not how they're going to look at it. First of all, they don't just say, uh, they're, you know, their holistic assessment is usually much broader and deeper than saying your GPA is higher than your GPA. They're looking at so many other factors be, beyond that. They would say that if you show me, you know, I have a hard time putting Spanish in a second tier category because it's a core class. So if this would have been like, you know, piano and I don't know, astrophysics or something, I don't know, thinking that's maybe a bad example just popped in my head. You know, what most schools will say is if you, they want you to pursue your passions, highly rejected. Right, right. And if you, you can show me why you're interested in piano, then take piano. Now, you do have to have a certain requisite amount of rigor to convince the school that you can do their program, but they're not just simply rotely saying you had more rigor than you than you did, so we're going to go with the person that had more rigor than you, or they're not saying, oh, your GPA is higher than your GPA, so we're taking the kid with the higher GPA. So, like, this might be a unique idiosyncrasy with North Carolina. Well, also places like Texas, you know, Texas is a huge state and they have, you know, that top 7% auto admit. 6%, so, yeah. 6, 6%, yeah, plus sorry. Seven. Um, it's hard to keep track. It was 10, then it went to 7, then it went to 6. <laughs> so, yeah, so certainly I would say be aware of state systems and how states admit. And if you're in a, if you're looking at schools that are using state systems where GPA is being calculated that way then that's certainly something you should be cognizant of. But when I think of highly rejective private schools, I don't know any of them. Right. That, I don't know a single one that thinks this way, not one. So I really yeah. want to push back uh, for the highly rejected private schools that they're not operating that way. They're looking, they're looking at so many things. They're lo they are looking at your rigor in light of your intended major. If it's a school that admits by college, you know, and sometimes even if it's not a school, like even if it's just a liberal arts school that admits into, you know, the whole college, they still like if you say that you're interested in, let's just say you say that you're interested in comp sci, they are going to scrutinize your, your, your math curriculum, your math grades, your math trends and put a little bit more weight on that. And if you want to be an English major, they're going to look at things a little differently, even at a liberal arts school. So they'll look at things that way. They'll look at, they'll also, you know, why you took what you took matters. And there's an opportunity for that. And schools actually decry somebody just automatically thinking that they have to take the absolute most hardest course every single time. And that that somehow benefits them. They don't like that type of thinking. Now, don't get me wrong. In the more selective schools, they expect a very, very, very high level of rigor and not maxing up the curriculum in most of the solids, which are math, English, science, social studies, foreign language, is, is there, there needs to be an explanation if you don't do that, why you did that. Uh, but there's just not this type of rote GPA being compared in the private schools, uh, which is most of the highly rejectives. So I think that for state systems, you, you know, for a few state systems, you need to be cognizant of how they're keeping tabs. No question about it. You, if you, if you know for Texas, if you're, once again, this is Texas residents. Okay. This would need to be a Texas resident. She's a Kentucky resident because that top 6% plan doesn't apply to non-Texas residents. Um, you should be aware of how that's calculated, but it sounds like you want to say something, Lisa. 
Yeah, I just wanted to say, though, that here in, in North Carolina, there's a movement to try to get class rank taken off of the transcript, at least when it's sent to public schools, because you can have excellent grades. Let's say our student who took the piano because they love piano and they want to do that, they're going to be in, I'm going to say, the top 40% of their class just because of that decision. Like it's going to bump them down that much. A school can't unsee that and they can't unknow that. Um, even if it's a ridiculous mathematical computation. And so parents are trying to get the state to take it off the transcript, at least for schools that are outside of North Carolina public system. But so far it has not been successful because it's not really, it's not really a rank that means much in, in some ways, you know, but like a school like Clemson, for instance, they use class rank as part of their formula for admission for in state and out of state students. So if you, or a North Carolina student applying to Clemson, and you took piano, you're going to get dinged for that with that too, with that formula. So, I mean, maybe somebody will holistically look at it and say, oh, yeah, but this kid took piano. So, who, you know, this is a great kid. I mean, I don't support any of this. And that's one reason I was super excited when Sonia did get into a private school, because I was not looking forward to this game at all. And it's really antithetical to how I view education. But it's there. Yeah, and I feel so strongly about that. Like, if your kid loves piano, I want to encourage them to pursue piano. And if a school ends up dinging them because of that, then to me, I'd rather you pursue your love of piano. There's so many other schools out there that won't do that. And so I'm not in, in, I'm not going to use this microphone to squelch people not pursuing things they genuinely love because there are oh, a few yeah, schools out there. And, and, no, I'm not suggesting you are either, but I just want to make it really clear how I feel like nurturing your love for piano is if that's what you have is so important to me, then there are plenty of schools out there that will not ding you for that. Um, but yeah. I do think you need to be an informed citizen. Well, you know, and it's just like, you know, there's, it's a money thing though. Right. I mean, you know, UNC Chapel Hill is a great bang for your buck if you're in state and it's very prestigious and I would consider it a highly rejective school. And, you know, that's like twenty, twenty five thousand dollars a year for an in-state resident versus maybe paying 40 or 50 for the school that loves them back. Um, it's just a big deal. And I think that it's I the system is bad. I don't like it, but it exists. And if if Sonia were in public school, I would tell her not to take piano. I would get her private lessons. I'm just being honest yeah. <laughs> because I would mm-hmm. want her to have the highest GPA she could. I would have to play the game. I feel like you need an actuary here to plan your schedule, <laughs> you know, to compute everything um, because it's it's so complicated. You know, in some ways, I'm glad we're having this conversation because, you know, we have seven co-hosts. We don't agree on everything. And I think it's good for people to hear different views. You know, like I, I, I would I would take a different perspective and it doesn't mean that I'm right or you're right or wrong. It's just two different people with two different views um, on that. Now, I do have a question. Um, You know North Carolina better than I do and how they operate and how they make decisions. But I remember when North Carolina came out a while ago with a lot of research that showed once you have taken five APs, we consider five AP and eight APs you know, almost negligible. Like you've proven to us you have you have the rigor to do our program and you don't need to be chasing a zillion APs and driving yourself crazy because our research shows five APs, eight APs. It's almost the same thing. Do you remember that when they, when, they, when North Carolina yeah, revealed no, that research? I, I, I think they do have that research and I agree with that research. I just don't know, like if you are looking at a percent mm-hmm. of class that you will consider more seriously than others, I just don't know if they're actually following that because in order to, if your competition is taking, you know, nine APs, then you got to take 10 APs to beat them. Right. I mean, it's just, that's why some of the high schools here are so competitive and stressful for their students. Well, that's another thing I wanted to to bring up and you're the person, perfect person to bring this up to like this. I have to do more APs than everybody else. That's part of, in my opinion, what's causing a lot of the mental health issues. No question. So at at what point do you say it's not worth sacrificing my mental health? Because that's one of my core things I share with people when they're looking at, you know, how much rigor to take or not take is to, you know, you, you know, it's not worth sacrificing your mental health. And that's always one of my questions. And so this, 
I need to outdo my competition with AP seems like a recipe for all kinds of mental health calamities, which I know you're very sensitive to. So what are your thoughts on that? I think it's horrible. I, you know, I, I'm going to be up the front and honest. I disagree with a lot of decisions that the North Carolina state legislature makes, but they're the ones who decide this because our education here is like as a state in Illinois, it's sort of more local control. So a school district could say class rank. We're not doing it. Sorry, folks here. You even as the school district wants to, and I believe the Chapel Hill Carborough city school board would love to get rid of class rank for this reason. They can't. And so, you know, I think this is what happens when you have people who aren't educators making decisions about education, because, you know, for them, it's just it's cut and dry. And this is what, you know, it just makes it easier at the college level without any consideration of how awful that is. It pits kids against each other. What about collaboration? Right. Right. But I guess what I'm asking is like, because you're saying I would just play the game and get private lessons. And what I'm saying is. At what point do you say it's not worth playing the game because you're putting my kids' mental health at risk and it's just not worth it? That's what I'm asking. I think that's an individual um, I agree. thing. And, you know, obviously, if, if Sonia was becoming um, like, you know, b- very anxious or whatever, I would I would pull it. You know, I would call that. But if, if until that happens, I would try to play the game, I guess, just because I feel like I'd be giving her the most options. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm glad you I'm glad you said that. I think that's important. I wouldn't assume that every listener knows that. You know what I mean? That you wouldn't say I'm just playing the game no matter what, that there are some, you know, restrictions. (laughs) So you think every listener thinks I would just keep my kid in that? No, no, no. No matter what? No, 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 no. I don't think every listener would think that. I think that the statement I would play the game if she was in public school was sort of made just in general without qualifiers. And I think that, it, yeah. you know, it's it's important to make those qualifiers um, have them because not everybody will just automatically assume that. I'm, I'm not saying that they would assume that <laughs> the opposite and probably most would. But I think I think you I just think it's better. It's really important to be really clear in in that, you know, and I know that, of course, about you and probably most listeners do as well. But I just wouldn't assume that everybody would hear that and say, Okay, there's no conditions on this at all. I'm playing the game no matter what. And so I just think it's important right. to, to add but, those. But you in know, it, I mean, and I, you know, I of course like I always joke with Lily because she's Indian and she has dumb white parents. We didn't push her in the way. But you know, I think there's some cultures where they are going to play the game no matter sure. what if that's the game. And I do think that's really hard on kids and hard on their mental health. Yeah. So And that's all. I just wanted I, I just wanted to bring that point up because I think that there can be, and you, you of all people know this, like it, it, part of me feels funny talking to you about mental health. <laughs> You're the expert, <laughs> but you know, but I don't want to assume that, I mean, we have all kinds of different listeners in terms of, you know, how they hear things. And I just want, if there's one thing I've learned in six years doing this, like try to be as clear as possible when you're communicating, because somebody can sometimes hear things a little differently than maybe they were intended. And so I'm always going to yeah. err toward the side of clarity. And so I just wanted to get clarity on that. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I mean, parents are placed and children are placed in a horrible position where you have to have these conversations like, you know, how mentally ill can I push you to get this GPA? Right. But the system is just ridiculous and awful. I just I cannot, you know, say that enough. And it's a systems issue. Yeah, and I'm, you know, and I'm glad that you, you know, are there to bring this other side up because mostly, you know, there are some state systems. And, you know, you and I have talked about North Carolina a lot uh, off off air about this and how how this operates and how much it grinds your gears. You know what I mean? Like I know this burns you up. Um, it's the first time it's come up on air, but I, you know, there may be other schools I'm not even thinking of as well that also do this because to me when I think of the highly rejective privates it's just not how they think and it's just not how they operate they're not right and I because I, I don't want people to think that they're going to automatically say five oh better six bet five oh better than six four six four so we're going five oh over four six four like they're a lot more sophisticated in how they look at curriculum you know in in so many different ways you know than then it's just a GPA comparison thing and I find that's what surprises a lot of people because they're like, how did this kid who was ranked 13th not get in? And this kid that was ranked 59th got in and they're shocked by that because they don't understand how actually decisions are actually made and, and, you know, in schools, but I think we beat this one up enough. Okay. 
We're good. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, I think some some of I think some of our best discussions, Lisa, are probably when we don't always take the same side of view because I think, you know, that's like a way to make people think, right? People can think about things from different perspectives, and then they can process and decide for themselves, like according to their values and their beliefs, like which way they want to come down. Like, I would just say it's not worth it. I'm not doing it. Like, you know, it's like there's other, there's plenty of other schools out there. That's my view. Sure. You know, yeah. but you also bring a good view up. Like you're walking away from something pretty good that, you know, may be worth making some sacrifices and doing some things like you may not want to do to get what you want to get. So I, I think that, I think both arguments have, have merit. We just have different we just come down on different down come down on different sides of the fence, and I think that's okay. I just wish the fence didn't exist. I know we both agree <laughs> on that. There we agree hundred <laughs> percent. And now this week's interview with a special guest. Friends, if you didn't hear Lisa's first part of her interview with Evan Mandery, I strongly encourage you to go back and listen to part one so you can get a greater context from which he will speak. But in part two, Evan talks about how we can do the best for our kids, but challenge gross social inequities simultaneously. He talks about the gross inequities, like the unique tax breaks that elite colleges get. He talks about why Teach for America has been so successful. Evan challenges Lisa when she says it's hard to justify paying an Ivy League tuition and working at a low-paying public school teaching job. Evan praises Bates College for the work they're doing to change society. Evan talks about how legacy preferences are indefensible. He talks about a bill he authored to make a difference in college's fixation on the well-resourced student through the use of legislation. And Evan talks about the ways schools like Harvard have flawed admissions practices. Listen and enjoy. In some instances, people are sending their kids to private schools, which have, you know, implicit agreements with these colleges to uh, admit a certain number of students um, per year. And, you know, when you get to distinguishing excellences you know, I mean, I was a smart high school student, but I couldn't have done a a Westinghouse project at the time. I needed help. You need help, <laughs> right? And right. Yeah. And they give help. Yeah. Well, or you can buy a lot of help. Um, so, you know, these are apologies. And I'm, I'm very careful not to. I have no beef with any parent doing what's best for their kid that I understand. I'm a parent too. But we could do the best for our kid and still flag gross systemic inequities. And these are highly, highly inequitable mechanisms. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, it's hard being like one of those white progressives. And yet, you know, my kids are going to a private school because the public schools, you know, um, were just non-functional. And it's funny because they've gone, my kids have gone to public schools all their lives and they describe their classmates who've been in these private schools, like just living in a bubble. They don't even understand, you know, things around them. And I'm sure my kids are going to get very comfortable in that bubble very soon, you know, but then what was I supposed to do? Have them have a bad education where kids are doing drugs in the classroom? I don't know. I don't know what the right answer is, but it's really hard. But I see what you're saying and it makes complete sense. I, each per person has to work that out for themselves. Right. Yeah. And well, I'm still working on that one, I guess. And probably that's going to be a life's work. In, in addition to this, like you talk about how, like, so public education, so state institutions, they're cutting funding for those, you know, for the state colleges, yet um, not profit, not for profit schools like Harvard get a huge tax break. And that's actually subsidizing them at the cost of our public school system. So tell me more about that. We, we send massive subsidies to colleges with giant endowments. So um, a sociologist uh, named Charlie Eaton estimates the collective tax break at worth about $20 billion per year. And just sort of intuitively what the big ticket items are there, the money that you give to the colleges to tax is tax deductible. The colleges earning 
earnings on its endowment and the money that you give is tax deductible. And then all of these colleges are getting some type of preferential real estate treatment, right? So most of their campuses are not taxed, even though they're extraordinarily valuable. And then they're also often getting state preferential treatment in terms of state taxes. So it's a triple or quadruple effect and easy to see it. You know, and then what I say is, I, I mean, I, I'm not asking for perfect. I'm just flagging like really, really grossly inequitable. These colleges are letting in the overwhelmingly rich kids, right? So there are 38 American colleges where more students uh, come from the top 1% than the bottom 60%. If you're born into the bottom income quintile in the United States, your chance at ending up at one of what uh, Raj Chetty and John Friedman termed the highly selective colleges is about 1%. Your chance of getting to an, uh, uh, to an elite college is about a third of that. So, you know, we, we, we have a strict, pretty strict caste system in the United States. If you're born poor, um, you're, this, is a, this is a staggering perspective one. If you're born a top one percenter in the United States, your chance of attending a selective college is greater than a person born into the bottom 20, the bottom income quintiles chance of attending any college and more than half of the any college is community colleges, right? So if I'm born rich, I have a greater chance of going to Harvard than the poor person has of making it to, you know, borough of Manhattan Community College. Um, so, you know, if we were fueling an engine of socioeconomic mobility, then I'd be like, I understand what we're getting money for. If we were, if schools were racially diverse, I would say that that was really good. But, you know, aside from kind of Harvard and Yale and Stanford, they have black representation around 15%. By the way, the lion's share of which is children of immigrants, not right, that's generational African-Americans as Harvard students refer to it. So in most other colleges, you know, you have about 8% black representation. And I'm on the side after the Supreme Court ends race-based affirmative action. I think it's more likely to get worse than it is to get better, though, you know, people have a different view. And then I would say it would be mitigating if they were producing a lot of do-gooders, but they don't. Yeah, that's another point I wanted to get to. So say more about that. Yeah, I mean, about 60% of Harvard students either go into management consulting, tech, or uh, investment banking. When I went to college, it was the legal profession or medicine, but those aren't even really high status jobs anymore. Something like two to 3% of Harvard graduates go into education, but excuse me, I'm sure the lion's share of that is people who go to Teach for America. And that's a two year commitment. And, you know, uh, by contrast, you know, where I teach, depending how expansively you define community ser public service, two thirds to three quarters of our students go into public service. So, you know, we have colleges of the rich producing our investment bankers and management colleges, uh, management consultants, and we have colleges of the poor um, educating our cops and teachers and firefighters. Mm -hmm. But I think what you mentioned is the students kind of don't start off at Harvard that way. You know, they might have different intentions going in. So there's some kind of socialization process that happens. Can you say more about that? For sure. Um, I mean, I, I try to be pretty... I mean, Harvard's story, elite college's story is always that they're just kind of reduce, reproducing underlying inequities and inequalities in society and that they're just doing what their students want. So I'm always kind of keeping that in the back of my mind. And I highlight the research uh, of a, a sociologist I greatly admire named Amy Binder. Uh, she's at UC San Diego. And, you know, she says, and this is consistent with my own experience, that nobody really goes to college thinking they want to be an investment banker. I certainly had no idea what that meant when I went to college. But what you do is you have a bunch of high achievers and they're like, oh, OK, what's the highest status job? And so, you know, they they perceive that that's something that they should be competing for. And in fact, it's widely perceived that Teach for America, that which is more successful than any other kind of similarly situated nonprofit, that the basis of its success, and it was founded by uh, a woman who was a management consultant, is that they've structured it competitively. So even if you're doing going into this low status profession teaching you're getting you're winning the competition so it satisfies you know our our and i say this as somebody who had this mentality briefly satisfies our fundamental programming <laughs> yeah i mean that is really interesting um you know and i think like i probably like if they are making some kind of financial commitment to school working as a teacher you know like 
as a consultant, if somebody said, oh, I want to go to Yale and I want to be an elementary education teacher, I'd be like, don't, don't do that. You'll never pay that back. You know, I'm, and so like, it's just financially, it's not even a good equation. Now, I guess the super rich don't have to care about that, but. I don't know. I tell people all the time to be a teacher. I mean, I think teaching is the most noble occupation. I think you change people's lives and I think it's an incredibly fulfilling life. And I think what's hard is that you just have to be intrinsically motivated enough to understand that, you know, Marx called, talked about it as mystification. You know, <laughs> m most people are, most people think that things have value that don't really have any value. And, um, you know, um, I wish I made a little more money, but I wouldn't trade what I do for anything. Yeah. No. And that is no, I was not um, knocking going in to be a teacher. I agree with you. I think like, but paying Yale tuition to get a teacher's salary, that's, you know, where I think it's, it's hard. I, I hear what you're saying. I don't agree with that. I'm sorry. Can I, I say more? Yeah. I, I mean, like I, an argument. <laughs> I'm not going to argue with you. I mean, you you should believe, you, everybody could believe what they're going to believe. I mean, I, you know, one of my very good friends is uh, a high school teacher who went to Yale and uh, I don't think she, I mean, I don't think she has any regret about going to Yale. I, I don't think she would have, even if she understood in advance, um, you know, I think it's incredibly, her experience is incredibly important, uh, just as I think that my experience is important to my students and in telling them, you know, if nothing else, hey, I've been there and you could have done the work. It's not that you are, it's not that you are inadequate. It, it, it's that society is constructed in a way to make you believe that you're inadequate. And um, I don't know, I think I benefited from seeing, having that experience. Um, I, I think these spaces should be diverse in every sense of the word, racially and socioeconomically, but also in terms of what people's uh, careers are. I mean, I, I praise uh, Bates in the book. Bates, you know, goes, Bates has a whole center for purposeful work. It's, it's challenging people to think about what to do with their, how to live a meaningful life. And about 12 to 15 percent of Bates graduates go into education, which is, you know, a big number, certainly compared to Harvard and Yale. And I think taking a bunch of kids who I mean, I don't know if the point of your question is that if you had predetermined to uh, be an elementary school teacher, that it wouldn't be worth it to go to Yale. But I, I don't think that well, that's no, true. I'm not saying that. I think that, you know, going to a great college is, would be only an asset to a teacher. I'm just saying if that teacher has to pay, take out student loans that they will be saddled with then that will have a very negative effect on their life for 20 years, maybe more. Um, you know, I know there's some loan forgiveness programs, and hopefully they'll get to be easier to access. That's all I'm saying. Like, it's hard for people to put the investment in and think, I'm only going to get $35,000 a year, which I believe is the starting teacher salary in North Carolina. If they've gone instance. to, uh, if they've taken introductory economics, then they understand the cost of their degree is a sunk cost and they should do whatever is going to maximize <laughs> their prospective utility. <laughs> well, <laughs> I had a bunch of big words that I almost understood. Yes, you do. It's a sunk cost. You, you paid for it. I mean, I shouldn't, I shouldn't do something else because of money that I spent. I should do whatever is going to make me happiest over the remainder of my life. Let's take a break to learn about Mark's recommended resource for the week. This is Linda with this week's recommended resource, the Next College Student Athlete website. This comprehensive site covers all things related to college athletic recruiting. It takes families step-by-step -step through the process, including how to get recruited and how to search for colleges. It covers all NCAA divisions from powerhouse D1 programs to D3 teams. It reviews how to connect and communicate with coaches, create impactful highlight reels, and how to leverage camps, combines, and showcases. The site dispels common myths about athletic recruitment, like college coaches won't simply discover your talented student. Families need to actively drive the process. NCSA also provides advice on the importance of being a coachable student athlete, how you can benefit from evaluating a team's roster, and tips on determining if a team would be a good fit. With free webinars, videos, and step-by-step -step guides, NCSA helps families pursue college athletics strategically. If your student is interested in playing their sport at the collegiate level, learn more at ncsasports.org. 
Yeah. And that is something that I feel, you know, I'm, um, I grew as, as a child of the 70s. And so it was just drilled into us. You must do what makes you happy. You must do good things. I do not see that being mirrored in society as much today. Um, you know, to the point where my daughter um, was asking, Mom, why do you see clients for free? You, you, you're you not valuing yourself. You're not valuing your time. I'm like, yeah, but, you know, if I didn't do that, they wouldn't get any help in it. I feel good helping them. She's like, yeah, but, <laughs> you know, um, and my 11-year-old son is watching this, and he's sort of a smart aleck, and he's like, oh, wait, stop, guys. I'm watching an empath have an argument with a capitalist. This is hilarious. Go on. You know, but I think he really kind of, like, you know, struck at something with our society. You know, where I don't, I agree with you, but I don't think people think that way. I don't entirely agree. Uh, thanks for, I'm glad that you see, um, have pro bono <laughs> clients. I, thank you on their <laughs> behalf. Um, yeah, I think it's a, it's a pretty big, rich, poor value divide. Um, I agree that rich white people would almost would like if somebody said, oh, yeah, I went to Yale, I'm thinking about becoming a teacher, they would really look down upon that person. No student I teach thinks that way. And basically, I, I mean, I've taught a lot of really, really smart people. So I'll define that as like over 1400 on their SATs and, you know, got a 3A GPA. And many of them, I have two people at Penn Law now, you know, many have gone on to very prestigious institutions. Almost all of them. I only have one notable exception, go on to do some type of do good or career. And, you know, I don't even have to, my explicit agreement with them, um, you know, when I help them out is I'm like, just pay it forward, just, just pay it back to society. But they're already there. I mean, I have a, 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 a woman, she's portrayed in the book, Crystal Salvati. She's extraordinary. She's graduating from Penn and, you know, she's going to go work in a family law clinic in, in Brooklyn. So, you know, she's going to make bupkis, but. <laughs> She'll do a lot of good. She will. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's not the scope of this just discussion to talk about why are people who do good paid less money and, and valued less economically by our society. But I think that is a real problem. We agree. <laughs> so do you have solutions? Like what could we do either as a society or what could the poison ivies do to become less toxic? Um, what, what, what could we do going forward? Well, I'm, you know, it depends who we is, but um, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot, you know, I, I'm, I'm actually kind of optimistic about this. I, I'm not super optimistic about the state of American democracy or the future of the planet, but this is going to change. I mean, you know, legacy preference is, is ethically indefensible. There's no cogent defense of it. I mean, it just comes to, well, this is what we've always done, or it helps us raise money, but that's not an ethical position, right? Right. It right. would have to be, it helps us raise money to do other good. Um, but you never get the end of that sentence. So this will change. It's just a question of whether it'll take 20 years or 50 years or 100 years. The forces of change will be young people and alumni. Um, I mean, I think on balance, and there's lots of empirical evidence to support this, you know, young people in the United States have much, much kind of more, mm, they're more, more greater equity, uh, greater orientation to equity and kind of diversity, embracing of diversity. So I think there's lots of reason to be optimistic about this. I also think that college professors are, all share these value propositions. And so, you know, I must have interviewed a hundred people for my book and, you know, the majority of them teach at these colleges and then we'd have this conversation and then I'd go, well, what about your institution? And, you know, they make some exceptionalism argument. Oh, well, we're doing what we can, but they know it's wrong. I think, uh, we, uh, I helped, uh, I co-drafted a bill which has been introduced in Massachusetts and I'm very hopeful of doing this in other jurisdictions that imposes a fee, uh, a public service fee, we call it, on colleges that practice legacy or donor preference or binding early admission, which is devastating to financially needy students, and um, redirects that money to community colleges and their students. You know, Trump imposed a 1.6% excise tax on highly endowed colleges, but that was just kind of punitive, sort of like his 
um, you know, state and local tax, uh, state and local tax deduction cap. But I think legislation is possible. I think you have um, possible, I would say, almost likely over time. And you have an odd confluence here, which I think is the elite colleges have brought upon themselves where you have a lot of elites, anti-elite sentiment. Um, and I think they've fostered that by not taking seriously the need to open their doors to a wide range of people. So there's a lot of forces that I think are going to bring pressure on them. Mm -hmm. yeah, you brought up two points that I definitely wanted to ask you about. Number one, um, we've kind of referred to it in the background, the Supreme Court case regarding affirmative action. So I'm curious to know what your thoughts are about that and also about early decision. Um, as you mentioned, that is, I think we all agree that it's, it's really hard on poor students because they can't compare offers. But I'm really interested on your thoughts on both of those topics. Thanks. <laughs> I'm glad <laughs> anybody's interested in anything I have to say. They, uh <laughs> You know, the Supreme Court is going to end race-based affirmative action, right? So it's a, it's a pair of lawsuits um, brought by Students for Fair Admission, which is Ed Bloom's organization on behalf of, uh, you know, Asian applicants who were denied admission to these schools. I'm very skeptical that he has any commitment to the Asian or Asian American community. But, you know, I think we saw a pretty clear signal which way the Supreme Court is going. I would I would bet as much money that the court's going to, effectively overturn Bakke and Grutter versus Bollinger, as I would have bet that they were going to overturn Roe v. Wade. I think it's important that people understand how much of this is Harvard's own fault. So under Harvard's stated goal is to increase diversity, right? And under the Constitution, you know, affirmative action, any race conscious program is subject to strict scrutiny, meaning the, uh, the institution has to show it has a compelling interest. Diversity is re recognized as a compelling interest, but that it couldn't achieve the same objective by race neutral means. But of course, Harvard could have. Harvard could have stopped doing legacy preference. It could have reduced its number of sports teams. It could have reduced the number of people on the dean's interest list. It could have ended the preference that it gives to uh, children of admit uh, 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 faculty and staff members, would that have made admissions perfectly equitable? Of course not, but it would have opened up a significant number of spots to you know fairer competition, and people don't. I don't think people get this. Like at a college like Williams or Amherst, a third of the students are recruited athletes. Yeah, it's crazy. Another third of the students are legacies. Like these aren't like, you know, I'm not like talking about the margins. I'm talking about not even the plurality means of admission. It's the, it's the majority means of admission. And, you know, Harvard said, nope. They convened a committee and they said ending legacy would jeopardize critical institutional interests. And so the case went on to the Supreme Court. And you know, that's tragic because there is, I, I think, an ethically, you know, a constitutional and ethical defense of affirmative action, particularly for the descendants of slavery and the victims of residential segregatory practices in which almost all of these colleges either participated or abetted. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I... I Harvard Harvard portrays itself as a victim, but, you know, I don't see it that way. Mm -hmm. So talk to us about early decision. What are your thoughts about that? Well, early decision is early decision is a is a disaster. Um, I mean, you know, the simple fact is if you're a, a poor kid, you can't you can't afford to make a commitment to a college without understanding what your financial aid package is going to be. So everybody's known this for decades. The problem is that the uh, the common application has made it much easier to apply to uh, a wider swath of colleges. So, like, I think I applied to, uh, I think I applied to seven, not yeah, seven I plus to four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a feeling I'm older than you, but uh, I wrote mine. On, I wrote mine on a typewriter. So do I? Oh, uh, so did I. Yeah, oh, we will talk later and compare ages. Okay. So well, or, or or not, I'd be fine to skip that one. Um, <laughs> 
anyway, you know, it was hard. It took a lot of time. I remember working on it. And now, you know, you just click a button and you send it off to 18 to 20 institutions. And the problem is, you know, it, it used to be that sending an application sent a very strong signal about your likelihood of attending a particular institution, but now it doesn't. So the colleges, you know, they're dealing with a ton of uncertainty and kind of rationally, they turn to early decisions since that allows them to kind of fill their buckets easier, but it's bad. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, I mean, so a school like Harvard, um, or let's say University of Chicago, my alma mater, says that they would meet 100% of full demonstrated need for said poor students. So that student is at no risk to um, apply early decision. What are your thoughts about that? Well, people just don't understand the reality of it. And I, 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 I mean, I'll give the colleges the benefit of the doubt, and maybe some of them don't understand this. I was just talking to one of my students yesterday who told me that she got a, a free ride to Fordham, but for $1,000 a year. And I was like, what? Where did you go? <laughs> That's a great deal, but not free. <laughs> and then she said, $1,000 a year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, we don't look at it that way. Friends, this concludes the second part of Lisa's interview with Evan Mandry. We hope you'll join us next week for the final part. And now it's time for our College Spotlight of the Week. Friends, last week, Lisa and Linda talked about Lisa's recent visit to SCAD in Savannah, also known as Savannah College of Art and Design. It's a two-part spotlight, and now it's time for part two. Um, so there's a lot of cobblestones, historic buildings, historic cemetery. You know, it's allegedly the most haunted city in the United States. Oh, goodness. But I've heard that from a lot of cities, so... <laughs> Whatever. Yeah. We went on a ghost tour and Cade was like, why is it that all the ghosts are only colonial ghosts? Whatever happened to like, what about like, you know, the ghosts from the 1950s or those ghosts? Why don't we ever hear about modern ghosts? I'm like, this is such a good point. <laughs> modern ghosts don't sell, I guess. They're just creepy and not historic. Right, so, right. Um, so it, it's haunted, but, um, you know, so um, where kids live... Um, and housing is kind of an issue. So you can live in the dorms at SCAD. And when you're a freshman, you're required to live in the dorms and have a meal plan. And the dorms are really nice. They're like all suite style. Um, so two kids to a room, their own bathroom, and maybe some upperclassmen have some more apartment style. And they're sort of scattered throughout. And like the thing about SCAD is it's not like one campus. There's some buildings that are close by, but because they're using existing buildings in an existing city, you know, you're going all over the town. If so do they student. have shuttle systems? That, that oh, work? yes. Yeah. Okay. They have SCAD buses. And it was like a weekend in the summer and every five minutes, some SCAD bus drove by taking somebody somewhere. I mean, and they have a whole route system and it's quite complicated. Um, so, yeah. And they'll even take you to the beach, uh, which is in Tybee Island, which we went to, which was so nice. Um, it's a great place to be on a hot day and it's like 20 minutes from the city. So, I mean, there are a lot worse things I could think of than to spend some time in Savannah going to school uh, and learning about art, but that's, yeah, me. I agree. <laughs> so, um, in addition to all the other stuff, they have a lot of like hoopla. I would say they have the Savannah, the SCAD film festival in Savannah every year. They have like a, their own museum, they have tons of exhibits. So there's a lot of stuff going on with the school that students can go to fashion shows because they have, you know, a fashion design program. Um, so it's, a, it's, you know, they do put on a big show. And so there's a lot of those kinds of things. Now, um, they do have athletics. It's, I think they're division three. They're the SCAD Bs. And I'm not sure exactly why they're the bees, but um, apparently bees are mysterious or, or I don't know. I, I sort of spaced out or cute. was distracted during that part of that scad story. But yeah, they do a good job with the bees and um, they have division three sports. I think they have like 16 of them and that's at a separate campus near the equestrian campus that's over the border across the river into South Carolina. So in terms of applying, this is kind of interesting. They have their own application and it's rolling. So you can apply early as a junior of your high school, your junior year of high school, and they don't require a portfolio for any of their programs. So you can just send in your transcript 
a, fill out their application. There's a two week turnaround and they tell you whether you're in or not. Only two weeks to, to get an answer regardless of when you apply. Wow. Yeah. So, um, and you know, they do have merit aid, but for those who do need to submit portfolios and they do have scholarships that range between like a thousand and 12,000. Now for the master's program, that's much more rigorous. Um, kids were disappointed about that one, but they would have to submit a portfolio. They have to write an essay, get two letters of recommendation and a transcript. So that seems like a more like traditional application process. So, I mean, and this is the kind of thing. So, you know, you could, like I, Lisa Ruff, could apply to SCAD and say, I want to paint. And Linda, you've probably never seen any of my artistic drawings. And there's a reason for that because they're very terrible. And I could go get my BFA in painting, you know, and they would just kind of take me in at the novice level. You know, they say they have these, um, t- you either a, you can be a Joe or a pro. And if you're a Joe, then you're a beginner. And the teachers will teach you beginner things. If you're a pro, they're going to give you higher level things. So they're going to be differentiating. So, um, but I mean, I could come out of that a better painter than I am now, but maybe not going to be a successful artist. And I think that's one of the criticisms of the school because they don't have portfolios and they have a pretty high admission rate, which, you know, is like around 80%. They have a 25% yield. but Look at RISD, for example, that has a 20% admit rate, and they definitely require some portfolios around there. So, you know, some people say CAD takes your money, or sorry, SCAD takes your money, and then you have all this debt, right? Because the financial aid piece for need is not great. And then you're not going to be successful because you never had the talent to do it in the first place. On the other hand, I could say, you know, if somebody, if their dream and somebody wants to do it and maybe they would have the talent, you know, but they don't have a portfolio because um, our tour guide was saying his, you know, high school just didn't value the visual arts. So he didn't have a portfolio. Um, but, you know, he could still pursue his dreams. So were you going to say something, Linda? Um, so I was curious about the the outcomes. Did they share? What are their students doing afterwards? How is career placement, internships, things like that? Well, I think that they have, um, they say that 99% of their students are engaged in their field, employed, or are going to graduate school within 11 months of graduation. And that's been consistent for the last five years. Now, they, I mean, if you look at their videos, I mean, gosh, everyone's working at Google and Netflix and Apple. And I mean, they, they do have pipelines into these companies. And I do think there are certain places where if you go to SCAD, and they, the person that you're working with has gone to SCAD, like they know your training and that could be a bump. But I do think that maybe there are some kids who drop out or don't finish. We don't have data on those people. We, you know, when they might have still have a significant student loan debt, though. Sure. In terms of the financial aid, the cost of attendance is around 63000 And again, you could get those um, merit scholarships. Yeah. But I don't think you're going to get a lot of need-based financial aid. It's the only information session where I ever they ever suggested you go look on scholarships.com and get yourself some outside scholarship. They made it seem like it was so easy. Like you just write an essay and bam, you've got money, you know? It doesn't work that way. <laughs> dang, dang. Um, I know. So in that sense, like if you're a, need, a student who has significant financial need, it would be a hard school to go. And in fact, that's Kate applied there when he was in high school and it was his dream school. He really, really wanted to go there, but his family, um, you know, is not wealthy. They didn't have the money. His father passed away. So money is very limited in their household. And so, you know, I think they knocked him down to like 45,000 a year, but he still couldn't afford to go. So he went to the University of Illinois and, you know, they have a great support program there. And he basically did not pay a dime for anything in college. Um, so he has no debt. Um, he got a great education. But, um, you know, I think he still that's why he was so interested to visit it, because he's like, this is my dream school. And so now he's he's considering going to get a master's at some point there because he does still want to have that experience. But so, you know, what I would say is if you don't need financial aid, I mean, like, let's say if 45 is, you know, comparable to a lot of private colleges, um, then, you know, maybe the, and your, you know, family has saved or can afford that, then maybe that's fine. But I think, you know, if you go to SCAD, you need to be talented in your field and you need to be really 
sure that you want to go into some kind of artistic creative career because if you're not there's nothing for you so i mean it's not like a college where like let's say like unc Asheville, right they have a great studio art program but you could also decide this isn't for me and then go major in history right and not transfer schools um and you're not going to explore a ton of other subjects say the general education requirements are sort of like if you're an architect your major, they're going to make sure that you take physics, but they're not making the graphic design kids take physics. No, but the calculus is just not even a thing at that school. Um, so that's, you know, a, that's appealing for a lot of people. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. But you might need to take statistics if you're going to be, um, you know, in the business of beauty and fragrance major. Um, so it's kind of like dependent on what you're doing. So you won't really have an opportunity to explore. Um, the other thing I think is that kids need to be independent because it's not a traditional college experience. Um, and I do think like, because it's sort of spread out over the whole city and, you know, you could get lost, I think, if you're not really motivated and, you know, going to go for all the opportunities. Cause I think it's just like anything else. If you are into it and you're good at it and you want to do it, all the opportunities are there for you. But I do think you have to, you know, you have to seek them out a little bit and engage with the system. I think, you know, we saw a lot of quirky art kids. I love quirky art kids. So that made me happy. Um, but you know, if you are a quirky art kid and you want to be with your people, they are at SCAD, my friend, they are at SCAD. Um, and then, you know, because we were also looking at a graduate school, I think it actually has a lot to offer for their master's programs, if that's something you're interested in. Because by then, like you kind of know what you want to do, you're more focused. So you're really just going there to get, you know, those specific opportunities you think are going to be most helpful for you. What's the mix of grad students versus undergrad? So there's like, um, I guess I would say it's one eighth are grad students because there's 16,000 students and 2000 are grad students. Okay. So, um, so it's not a huge program, but it's not tiny either. They have a lot of international students also. Um, I think that's a place that international students um, like to come. So it's, and it's a pretty diverse population of students as far as I could tell. Um, so, you know, I think for the right person, SCAD could be a great choice. I mean, you do kind of have to go in with your eyes wide open about you're not going to get a lot of financial aid and, you know, you're going to still have to prove yourself in um, your whatever creative career that you're choosing. But if that's something you know you want to do and you live and breathe that, then this could be a very exciting place. You know, I'm not artistic at all, but after being around SCAD for most of the day and seeing all the great art installations everywhere, art was everywhere. I was like, you know, if any place could get me into an artistic frame of mind where maybe something would happen, it would be SCAD. Because you're just immersed in art and creativity and collaboration all the time. Um, so I think if that's something that you love, like this could be a great spot for you. And then also you have the flexibility to move around. If you're like the kind of person who likes to go explore things and do things in different spots, like, you know, this could be a great school for you. Uh, a quarter in the south of France sounds very appealing. <laughs> Not going to lie. You know, I, I just I love the variety of majors because when I think of an art school, I I do. I think of of students uh, drawing and painting and maybe there's some sculpture in there and th they have sound design, immersive reality, furniture design, um, just such a variety of programs that you don't see other places. Uh, so I I can see a student taking a look at this and saying, oh, maybe I really am interested in that. And I love that they don't have uh, that portfolio requirement. So students don't have to feel like they're already a pro uh, before they come in. They can come in as a Joe. And I kind of like that. Is that an official term or is that just kind of, you know? I think it's a semi-official term that they use. It's part of the SCAD lingo, pro or Joe. Got it. I would be a Joe, like a Joey, like oh, really, gosh. really. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I should mention that while they don't have like that traditional core of, you know, um, general education requirements that in the way that many colleges, they do have a core basis for art techniques. Drawing is one, you know, so like you do have to make it through all those courses, even if that's not your specialty, because they want you to have a really good foundation and artistic skills. 
So that's where I think my Joe would truly come out. <laughs> same, same. So, but yeah, and you know, if you just, if you're in Savannah and you want to go to a, a really interesting tour, sign up for this one. Um, you will definitely be entertained and thrilled and delighted throughout. I will put it on the list. <laughs> so, well, any other questions or thoughts about SCAD? It sounds like a really special place and Savannah um, uh, is, is really amazing. And I, you mentioned Tybee Island and I had to think about why that sounded so familiar. And Lisa, do you know who got married on Tybee Island? J.F. Kennedy Jr. No, not me. <laughs> not me. <laughs> J.F.K. Jr. John John, um, which is why um, oh. uh, that stuck in my mind. Um, but anyway, uh, sounds like a great place. <laughs> and it sounds like you had a good weekend there. <laughs> oh, yeah, it was a lot of fun. So well, thanks so much, Linda, for going on this little journey with me. Lisa. Friends, on Monday's episode, we'll have a speak pipe question that was sent in looking at the University of Chicago and trying to understand why is their yield so high? And then Linda has her first interview, and it's with Ben Neely, and it's looking at the new digital SAT and helping us to understand how is this new digital SAT different from the old SAT? Ben Neely is, works for Revolution Prep, and he's an expert on the topic. We hope you'll join us on Monday. And friends, remember, it's not where you go. It's not where you go. It's not where you go. But it's what you do when you get there, and it's what you do when you get out of there. See you on Monday, friends. And that's our show. A big thank you to you, our listeners, for tuning in this week. If you find this podcast helpful, please follow us and you'll get every single episode as soon as it is released. If you're interested, there are a few ways you can really support our podcast. You can click the share button and send it to your friends and acquaintances. You can help us pay our staff and our expenses by donating on our website. You can write a review for us on Apple or Spotify. I'm the producer of the podcast, but we have a fantastic team of 15. Shout out to our co-host, Dr. Lisa Ruff, Dr. David Williams, Linda Depker, Susan Tree, Vince Garcia, and Julia Esquivel. And to our substitute co-host, Sylvia Borgo. Our sensational sound engineer is Nemanja Motvich. Our amazing music is from Victor Allen Weeks. Marketing designs are from Kimberly Blass. Lily Parikh manages our Instagram. Our image editor is Talha Khan. Joyce Ducker does our website episode updates. And our webmaster is Stylianos Dimitru. And if you want to have a coaching session with Lisa, Linda, or me, just text me at 404-664-4340. If you have a question you want us to answer, or if you have a recommended resource or article you think we should discuss, just send it to questions at yourcollegeboundkid.com. Our favorite method is for you to record your own voice at speakpipe.com forward slash YCBK. By the way, check out our website where you'll find lots of content that is not on any podcast app. Our website is your collegeboundkid.com. If you want to learn about other hot admissions topics, follow us on Twitter at YCBK Podcast. We think of you as our listening family, and we look forward to meeting again with you every single Monday and Thursday.